and welcome to the Amplifying Scientific Innovation video podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Sophia Onoye Onye, founder and CEO of the Sophia Consulting Firm, a WeBank certified life science marketing and communications consultancy that was established in New York City with the goal of amplifying scientific innovation. The goal of this podcast is to showcase the importance of science advocacy health equity, and influential leadership through conversations with senior life science leaders who will share their unique leadership journey, corporate vision, and industry outlook. My guest today is Ms. Sabrina Johnson, president and CEO of Daray Bioscience, a clinical stage biopharmaceutical company committed to the advancement of innovative products for women's reproductive health. I first learned about that Sabrina and Dare when she was featured on PS Biotech back in 2019, where she shared her journey from a CNS focused biotech to founding her own women's health company, Dare Bioscience. I'm delighted that I now serve on the Dare board and we're all driven by the same mission, which is to identify, develop, and bring to market a diverse portfolio of novel therapies that expand treatment options, improve outcomes, and facilitate convenience for women. Welcome to the show, Ms. Sabrina Matsushi Johnson. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm excited. It's my pleasure. I, as you can see, I'm, I'm beaming in excitement just to speak with you <laughs> um, because you've always been inspirational. And now I would love for our audience to learn even more about you. And I can't think of a better way to start the podcast by asking my favorite question, which is what is your definition of scientific innovation? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I, you know, I think scientific innovation is really about addressing unmet needs, and that can come in a variety of forms. Sometimes we think of um, innovation in the pharmaceutical industry as being very focused on developing a brand new chemical entity, right? A brand new drug. Um, but, but I don't think of innovation that way. I think sometimes um, that that is innovation, right? That's that's innovation in a very big way. Um, but you can be just as impactful with innovation in, by really understanding what that problem is that you're trying to solve. And sometimes you can solve the problem with tools you have you know, readily available. Um, And so I really think of innovation as understanding the problem and coming up with the best fit solution for that problem. And in the pharma industry, sometimes that is a brand new chemical entity is really the only way you can get at that biology. But sometimes it's really just a matter of delivering the drug that we already know and understand in a way that makes more sense, right? right? Or using, using a product that we already know and understand, but realizing that it could apply to a different indication maybe that hasn't been, you know, addressed before. So, so I love that concept of, you know, defining the problem. Innovation is defining the problem and solving the problem in whatever the best fit solution is. I absolutely love the emphasis on the fulfillment of unmet medical needs, right? It's not just innovation for the sake of it, but it's such a patient-centered definition that I truly, truly appreciate. Um, so my next question for you is, obviously, as I mentioned in the intro, you have diverse therapy area uh, exp- expertise in the life science industry. What inspired your interest in women's health? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I have been very fortunate to be able to work in a variety of therapeutic areas. Um, it, it, a number of them, and, and they're all rewarding, right? Anytime you're, you're making a difference um, in medicine, I, it's truly rewarding. Um, but there did come a point um, in my journey, in my career, when I realized that there was a little bit of irony. I had worked in, you know, again, very broadly in a variety of therapeutic areas, but it occurred to me that I had never worked in women's health very directly. Um, Meanwhile, when I thought about what I did outside of work, right, in my personal life, it was very women's issues and women's health focused. All of my philanthropic work that I do is focused on women's empowerment, right, Um, enabling women, uh, you know, really um, giving women opportunities in education, in work, in life, and um, you know, fighting some of the struggles that, that predominantly women face in terms of domestic violence, things like that, as well as in reproductive health. And so I had an opportunity in my career to, to, to pause in a way that we sometimes don't get and just take a step back and, and say, you know, this is, this is interesting. I'm, I'm working therapeutically in areas that are meaningful, but it would be wonderful if there was a chance to really align my professional work 
with what I'm passionate about outside of work and actually bring those together. And so that was really the 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 inspiration to work to work in women's health. And and initially my my attempts to do that were um, first, you know, doing what I know best, which is working in the biotechnology pharmaceutical industry and trying to identify, um, you know, a drug development company or opportunity um, that was really focused in women's health. And I was not able to identify that. Um, you know, there, there just wasn't a lot of industry focus in women's health. And um, so initially I joined a global nonprofit, you know, once I made that, that decision that that's an area I wanted to work in, I, I did that. And that was really a rewarding experience, but it was that experience that, that really prompted me to then eventually start DARE um, because I realized that I could probably do more good for women if I actually started a company focused on advancing some of the, the innovation that I thought was potentially out there. Um, and that was the inspiration for it. And I would say one of the other things that got me focused on um, professionally wanting to work in women's health was I did have an opportunity when I was in the CNS space um, to work on the development of a product for fibromyalgia syndrome, mm -hmm. which while it's not a, you know, strict women's health condition the way we often think of women's health and that it's not reproductive health, but it is a condition that predominantly affects women. And I, and I will say, and that was the last therapeutic product that I worked on before I started, um, you know, before I started DARE and that, that experience itself also um, was part of the motivation in focusing on women's health, just having that opportunity to engage with the patients with that condition, understanding their patient journey and how hard it is sometimes, um, you know, as a woman communicating about something that that affects her in a way that maybe it's not affecting men, um, you know, in the healthcare system and needing to have that voice and, and having the opportunity to work with the patient organizations as well, um, you know, at that time, just all of that really inspired me that there's a lot of work that can be done here with the focus on women's health and, and to some of your opening comments too, just to create that kind of level playing field to make sure that, you know, all the needs are addressed. Um, so all of that really came together to, to inspire me to focus in this area. Uh, extremely well said. So in addition to our passion for women's health, you and I also share that CNS uh, passion as well. I had worked uh, with Pfizer's Lyrica uh, a few yes. years ago, and I think fibromyalgia, like you said, yes. is one of those uh, unmet medical needs that is not really voiced often. But as you mentioned earlier, uh, scientific innovation is really about uh, you know fulfilling unmet medical needs, and that can only be filled by passionate people like you. Now, if I think about DARE and, and through conversations that we've had, I understand and how difficult this next question will be. So I'll try and frame it as gently as possible. So your mentor and the DARE co-founder, Roger Howley, he recently passed away. Can you share more about his legacy and your combined vision for DARE? Yes. Now, I, I, it, it always is an emotional topic, but I really appreciate the opportunity to, to, to highlight what he's meant. Um, for this company. So I, I was fortunate to know Roger for quite some time. Um, when I was working at the company that developed the fibromyalgia product, Cypress Bioscience, he was on our board of directors. Um, and I think he joined the board in the early 2000s. So I, I'd known Roger for quite some time. And, uh, you know, we kept in touch as people do in this uh, industry, especially in San Diego, we're a very tight knit, knit life science community. So Roger and I um, kept close over the years. And um, ironically, and, and serendipitously, as life would have it sometimes, um, when I joined that global nonprofit that became the inspiration for forming DARE, um, Roger's company, he was CEO of Zogenix at the time, was literally across the hall. So Roger and I were interacting much more frequently um, then just because he was there and I would run into him in the elevator or whatever. So the, the day I had, um, so it was literally over a weekend that I decided to, to start DARE. <laughs> um, and so on a Monday morning uh, with the support of my wonderful husband, my other wonderful champion, um, I went in and gave notice uh, at work and said, I really, I, I have this vision. I, I need to, you know, I love what we're doing in the nonprofit space, but I need to do this and start this company. So at 9 a.m. in the morning, I, I gave notice. And you know, 11.30, I called a lot of my friends that kind of worked in that neighborhood and was like, we have to go to lunch. I'm so excited. I'm starting a company. 
Um, and, uh, and so as I'm leaving for lunch, I run into Roger in the elevator and he said, oh my gosh, you're, um, you look so happy today. So excited. I said, oh my gosh, I am. I'm starting a company. I'm really excited. And I was telling him about it. And he said, well, you're not going to believe it. I just announced my retirement today from Zogenix. Um, and I would love to hear more about what you're doing. And if you're open to it, I would love to, to mentor, you know, really, and help you, um, on, on, on doing this. And so that was the beginning. I mean, it was literally, we, we, we met in the elevator. So he, um, I obviously took him up on his offer and we met for coffee and I outlined, you know, my, my vision and, and why, um, you know, it was really to create this, what Dari is today, really this roll up women's health company with, with a very robust portfolio addressing a lot of different indications and, and unmet needs. And so I outlined it for Roger and I, you know, we, we, sometimes we have big ideas and, and I'm one of those people, sometimes I leap and then I'm like, oh wait, there's no net. <laughs> um, so I leaped and I realized I have no idea actually how to start a company. <laughs> um, I don't understand. And I've never worked in a private company. My background was all publicly traded companies. So I realized, oh my gosh, I, I, I know how I'll, I'll know eventually how to execute, but I have no idea how to get this going. I have no idea how to get the initial funding. Um, so Roger really literally just took the lead and um, embraced the vision, um, you know, that I had and, and it became our shared vision for the company. And really, if it were not for Roger, all, all of the original money that came into Dare was all through Roger's network and him, you know, telling people, I believe in this, I believe in her, I believe in the company and just making it happen. And then he was just with us, you know, all along the way until his passing, it's part of the journey and, and always a huge champion and always knew somehow, I don't know how he always knew this, but he magically always knew whenever I needed a little boost, um, I would, you know, suddenly have this text on my phone full of wonderful emoticons and all capital and exclamation points and how, you know, you're doing it, you know, stick in, you know, stick with it. Um, so he's, you know, he was a champion and a mentor in, in every way and is dearly missed. Well, thank you so much for sharing that story. It's hard for me to keep a dry eye as I listen to you because I had a mentor, my PhD advisor, Dr. Amy Anderson. She actually passed away from lung cancer a few years ago. And I think I'm still traumatized. I, yeah. I don't know if I'll ever get over it because it's not often that you meet people that want to support your vision. And so I'm glad that you had the experience and, and his legacy will always live on through direct. So thank you for yes. sharing that. Yes. And speaking of Dare, uh, can you provide a top line update on ongoing work? Yeah, I definitely can. So, um, so again, harking back to Roger, like I said, he was he was very, um, uh, very much embraced the vision that we had for the company, which was to build this very robust portfolio, and um, and and that really is what we went off to do. So, so we were able to go public in 2017, um, creatively via reverse merger. But as I said, that's the world that I understood. So, I was very happy to be public. Um, so, we went public in 2017, and that was really the the catalyst to execute on the. Vision that we had for the company and really build the portfolio. And we spent mostly 2018, one product came in in 2019, but mostly 2018 building the portfolio. And our vision was to, to start with four, I call them therapeutic pillars, um, areas of focus where we felt they were some of the most both pressing unmet needs, but also innovation existed to address them, right? So we could make a difference fairly quickly. So contraception was one, sexual health, vaginal health, and fertility. Those are really the four areas. And so, and, and our other vision for the portfolio, which we don't always talk about, but was always part, part of the vision was to, to make sure that the, the pipeline had breadth in terms of um, phase of development, right? So that we would have late stage programs all the way through to preclinical so that as programs are moving through and advancing, you've got, you know, you've got the funnel, right? You've got new programs that are coming through. So that was really the vision. So a snapshot of the portfolio today um, is it's it's a lot more fun and exciting to talk to us now than it was you know two years ago <laughs> for sure. But um, a snapshot of where we are today, uh, we actually filed our first new drug application this year for bacterial vaginosis. Super exciting! Uh, our Pradufa date is next week, Tuesday, December seventh. So um, very excited about that. Um, and then we. Um, 
And so that's a very common vaginal infection that women experience, most common vaginal condition, frankly, that women of reproductive age experience and, and, and very important leads to infertility and preterm birth. So very important to manage it and very challenging um, to keep it under control. So we are very proud to be working in that space. Um, and then we have a program for contraception um, that is already partnered with the, the global pharmaceutical company Bayer for the United States. And it's a Thank you. It's a hormone-free vaginal contraceptive product once a month. Um, so we are working right now on a regulatory submission to enable us to, to go into a phase three study next year uh, with that product. Um, we have a, a, a program for female sexual arousal disorder, which I always love talking about because I, I find people don't know what that is. And, and to me, that's devastating because it is as common. It's her version of erectile dysfunction. And it's as common in women and as devastating for women as erectile dysfunction is for men, and yet there's nothing approved today to treat it. Um, so we are in a phase 2B study right now um, with a, a vaginal cream formulation of sildenafil, same active that's in Viagra. Um, so that's happening. And then we have a different vaginal ring technology that is uh, had a great phase one for hormone therapy, delivering hormones over 28 days. Same technology we're looking to bring forward for preterm birth and infertility, delivering progesterone. Um, super excited about a, a phase one, two. We started this year for um, breast cancer survivorship, where women who have hormone receptor positive breast cancer often can't. Uh, so one of their side effects of therapy is, is a condition called vaginal atrophy that can cause very painful um, intercourse and, and other challenges. And for women that are you know, surviving their breast cancer um, can, can really, these other aspects that can happen in their lives can be as devastating in many ways as the cancer was, right? They get beyond the cancer and now they they don't feel they can have the same kind of interpersonal relationships that they could. And, and these women can't often take the normal estrogen-based therapies that other women might take for the condition. So we're developing a vaginal hormone-free approach using tamoxifen to treat that condition. And so that's in a phase one, two um, clinical trial right now. And then we have some really exciting preclinical contraceptives. Um, one that um, we are working in collaboration with the Gates Foundation to develop um, that is an implanted form of contraception that um, can be paused or resumed based on her needs. Uh, and also an injectable contraceptive that we're developing super discreet once every six months um, that, you know, um, can give her that protection, you know, over that six month period, but without her having to remember to do something every day or take something or have something that someone else might see, right? Some women are seeking a contraceptive method that is truly discreet, right? It's her decision and, and she doesn't have to have something that others might know about. So that's that's a that's a snapshot version. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I've always been blown away by your knowledge. Like I don't know how you keep track of everything, but that's the unique skill that I think is driven by your passion and your commitment to Dare's mission. I believe that was what eight different pipeline assets. Yes, yes. <laughs> wow, wow. And I joined the Dare board back in March of 2021, and it's really been a truly delightful experience. So thank you for showing what it means to be a leader in, in women's health innovation. Oh, thank, so thank you. That. So thank now we're <laughs> it's my pleasure. So we're going to take it uh, off maybe a big picture view. Uh, so what advice would you have for early to mid-stage career women and men who are looking to secure their first board seat. What would you say to them? Yeah, you know, I, we've been very committed um, at, at Dari to create those opportunities for people in part because I will be honest with you, when I was seeking my first board seat, um, you know, and I had been, uh, you know, you, you said nice things about my background, which I appreciate, but I, I had, you know, I have a great background. I've been a public company CFO for you know, 10 years. I, I'm an engineer by training. I'd worked in a variety of therapeutic drug development areas. And when I was first seeking my first board seat, I found it incredibly challenging, right, to, to just get the opportunity, right, to, to be noticed. And frankly, my first public company board seat was Dare. <laughs> um, and, and now I'm on two other public company boards right now, but, um, but that was the first, you know, opportunity. And, and so I think but but it's changing. Um, you know, the world is definitely becoming a, be a better place in that regard, with a lot of initiatives that are happening. And and I think people recognizing the importance of having a diverse board. Right, diversity of thought leads to to great outcomes uh, and innovation. 
Um, so my advice to people that are, you know, working on that and, and seeking those opportunities is first and foremost, you, you have to be your own champion, right? You do not, uh, you cannot be fearful. Um, you cannot worry about um, whether you have all the right experience or the fact that you have not, you know, served, you know, on a board um, before. So, so one is just that, like looking within and, and just knowing that you can do it. But there are also some very practical things um, that, you know, that ultimately I did as well. And I think can really serve people well who have those interests, women, men, anyone. Um, one is, you know, sometimes it's, it's a little bit easier to get an opportunity on a nonprofit board than it is a for-profit board. And bottom line, it's still board experience. You get governance experience, you get the leadership experience, you learn kind of that dynamic of how to interact with management versus your peer you know, board members. So I always encourage people to, if they haven't done that, do that. That's a, that's a great, you know, and it shows that you've learned those skills. And by the way, a lot of nonprofit boards are great networking opportunities that can help you secure that first you know, for-profit um, board seat as well. And the second is, you know, sometimes we don't feel it's necessary because we we feel like we know what you know what it takes. But it is super helpful to go through those the, the different programs that are offered by a variety of work organization, corporate directors forum um, in San Diego. There's a group Athena. Just a number of organizations provide um, kind of quick. Um, courses to just orient yourself to like, what does it mean to, to be a board member? And, and honestly, you know, you can learn a lot from those, but in addition to that, again, great networking. And, and it's also shows your commitment, right. To being a good board member, having gone through a program like that shows your commitment. And then third bottom line is it's network, 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 <laughs> just, you got to get yourself out there. Uh, you know, that the power of the network is incredible and, you know, you, you need to make sure people know that that's an interest um, of yours, uh, really every chance you get. Well, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. I was going to start clapping, but I was like, okay, maybe I shouldn't do that. Uh, but one of the things that really stood out was what you mentioned, right? Getting some experience in, 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 nonprofit, in, in nonprofits and, and other different types of organizations that will give you that board experience. Obviously, I you spoke at a recent event yeah. Uh, for the HBA, the Healthcare yeah. Business Women's Association, and I was president of the HBA prior to even joining the DRA board, and now I'm part of the DRA nominating and corporate governance committee. So there's a level of continuity that starts yeah. with what you say, which is to be your own champion. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, but I imagine that this whole concept of self-championship is one that, you know, sort of precedes even just board seats. So uh, I'm curious to know some of the unique challenges that you have faced as a woman in the biotech industry with fundraising, especially in women's health, which, as we very well know, represents what, what is that? roughly 4% of R&D dollars, even though women make up more than 51% of the population, make 80% of the household decisions. So tell me more about some of the challenges that you've faced with raising monies and, and also what coping strategies have you adopted over the years? Yeah, so, so I, you know, I would say there's a couple things. Um, and, and we talked about Roger Hawley, who was one of my incredible mentors. I've, I've been very fortunate. I've had three incredible all male, um, as, as it turns out, but three very incredible mentors in my career to whom I am incredibly indebted. So one is Roger Hawley. Um, one is Jay Kranzler, who I'm about to, to talk about. Um, who was CEO when I was at Cyprus. And then another is Bill Rastetter, who currently chairs um, our board of directors at Dare. But so so years ago, um, so in, this is really going to date me, but in 2002, uh, I became a chief financial officer of a publicly traded company. And uh, that was at Dare, um, uh, not at Dare, that was at Cyprus, um, where Jay Kranz was CEO. And, um, and, and this is going to be relevant to fundraising and women's health, I promise. But um, so, uh, so he was CEO and he really gave me that opportunity. I was vice president of sales and marketing. So vice president of sales and marketing to CFO is not a normal career mm. move. Um, at all. But but Jay um, really felt that we had just divested the product that I was responsible for promoting, <laughs> right? Um, so we had just divested that product and um, and we didn't have a CFO at the time. And Jay really wanted to keep me on the team and, and felt that that would be a great opportunity for me and, and really felt that I would excel. He, he saw that being a public company CFO in many ways is about sales and marketing, right? It's about communicating it's about telling your story it's about engaging you know investors well 
So when I stepped into that role, which I was very excited and appreciated the opportunity to do, um, I, I felt I had to be different, hmm. right? So in sales and marketing, uh, which is an area where there are more women, right? Mm-hmm. In sales and marketing roles, I, I felt that I could just be myself. I had very long hair at the time. You know, I felt I could wear skirts and have my long hair down and, you know, do the, do the things that were Sabrina. Um, but when I moved into the CFO role, I felt like, oh, okay, now people need to see me a different way. So mm-hmm. I need to be super buttoned up, right? Hair mm-hmm. back all the time, pantsuits, um, you know, and, and not have my normal personality came out. And, and, and Jade, um, taught me one important, two important things, one relevant there and one relevant now also in in pitching about women's health. So right away when he saw this sort of transformation in me, (laughs) you know, he said, no, 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 I'm not sure what's going on, but you know what, you need to be yourself, like be comfortable just being, being who you are, right? Mm -hmm. People relate to people. um, And, um, you know, you don't need to dress a certain, don't feel like you have to dress a certain way or, or be a certain way, you know, be your individual self. Best advice I ever got. Um, also, because often when you're a woman in a sea of men, you really do stand out. <laughs> and, and if you're not, you know, afraid of that, like that can be a good thing. Everyone remembered meeting me, right? Um, everyone, you know, remember that one meeting that they had at the investor conference with the one female CFO at the time. Um, so, so that was really important advice that I still take with me, but the other, and, and it, and it helps today, right? I have to talk about uncomfortable topics with people, mm-hmm. right? I'm mostly pitching to men and I have to say the word vagina several mm-hmm. times, right? If you talk about the portfolio. So if I'm uncomfortable with it, it's going to make them uncomfortable. So just that bringing your whole self to the table is, is really relevant. Um, but the other thing that, that Jay said, which has always stuck with me is that, um, to be successful um, in business, whether you're negotiating a transaction, you're pitching, whatever it is, you, you have to be able to put yourself in the other person's seat, right? You have to be able to get in their head. You have to be able to understand what are their concerns? What are their objections, right? How, do you, how can you present something in a way that gets everyone aligned, right? If you're doing a financial transaction, you better have really good financial models. You need to model your way, their way, every which way. Um, and so that really came to pitching women's health, right? So now going back to that, in, in this universe where there aren't a lot of women's health companies, a lot, not a lot of funding, you know, happening in women's health, very early on, uh, we're rec- we all recognized at Dare that we had to make it relatable hmm. to the mostly men hmm. um, to whom we are telling this story. And, um, and, and so we always try to take it back to things they know. And by the way, healthcare investors often invest in therapeutic categories where they are fortunate to not have the direct experience with the disorder, right? Mm. Mm. Funds that are investing hundreds of millions of dollars in oncology companies don't all have cancer, right? Mm. Those portfolio managers, right? So, but, but what someone has done is done a good job of help making sure they understand the unmet need, that they've made the presentation relatable, that they've, you know, linked it to something that they know well. So, we really have tried always in our in our presentations and our pitches to, to do that at Dare, right? If we're talking about, you heard me do it before, if I'm talking about female sexual arousal disorder, I'm going to say erectile dysfunction in the same sentence because mm-hmm. people know what that means. If mm-hmm. we're talking about overpreen and how wonderful it is to have a convenient once a month contraceptive that doesn't require any activity in the moment and is non-hormonal, we almost always talk about how disruptive a condom can be <laughs> um, to the moment, right? Because everyone can relate to that. So so really just trying to um, make it not about, it is about women's health, obviously, but try to make the conversation not about women's health, but really about what is that unmet need and, and communicating that unmet need in a way that's relatable. Well, that was a really long answer to your question. But. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I love that because you are, uh, you're really great at piecing together stories that showcase where your insights are coming from. I think this concept of being able to relay relatability is something that people can actually respond to, like they get it. Like I will give you a quick example. When I was teaching chemistry, a mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23. <laughs> and most of my students hated that. But if I said, you know, remember eggs, like 12 a dozen eggs, 12 dozen roses, it's all the same thing. It's like, oh, we get it now. So it takes a level Great. of experience yeah, yeah. really to put those pieces together and yeah. it makes people smile. You see, you get it and you like it. So that's awesome. 
So my second to last question for you, and you already sort of mentioned a few along the course of our conversation, is what are some key factors that you think will be important for sustaining innovation in the life science industry, especially in women's health? Yeah, so I, I, I do think it's important to, to sometimes um, try to take that step back and, and, and be disciplined about not getting so caught up in always um, thinking in the context of brand new chemical entities, right? That, that, that is innovation, but, but sometimes that um, is so, it takes so much longer and is really, can be so far removed from what the real problem is. So, so and you said it earlier, you better than I did, right? It's just really remembering to take that patient centric approach, right? That human factor design approach, right? Putting the patient in the middle, in, in the center, right? That in the end, you're solving a problem for a human, <laughs> right? And so to do that well, you need to understand what that problem is. You need to really understand it. Um, and in the case of women's health, you really need to understand what that means for her. And, mm -hmm. and often in women's health, you know, part of why that becomes so important is because we are addressing conditions that are that are life altering, but not life threatening, right? Mm -hmm. And so that 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 sort of pendulum, mm -hmm. that shifting or that balance of what is acceptable versus not acceptable is very different, right? If you're if you if you're treating something where someone has um, you know, a very dire potential outcome, they're gonna be willing to tolerate a lot, right? For the hope of having that get better. But if you're going to be delivering a contraceptive to her, um, you know, it's important to her, but but she's gonna have a lot of other kind of risk benefit trade-offs that she's, you know, gonna be thinking about, right? Does the side effect profile acceptable? Um, is it convenient? You know, does it fit with her lifestyle? So, so in a lot of these women's health indications, almost more so than other therapeutic area, really putting her in the center is, is what it's gonna to take to, to ensure that you're driving home an innovation that matters. But also um, we can do a great job in solving problems. We can do an incredible job in solving problems, but we also need to make sure we've get that, that she has access to it, right? We can develop the best thing in the world, but if she can't actually access it because it's not covered by her insurance or she can't afford the treatment, then we have failed mm -hmm. um, as well. And so that piece of it, you know, has to be front and center um, every day, right? Making sure that it truly is better. We truly are addressing a need and that we have a compelling story for the payers so that you know, when, when hopefully products get to the finish line, um, that she will actually be able to, to have all the benefits that they can confer. Well, once again, extremely well said. And I, I like the loop because at the beginning of our conversation, you talked about innovation in terms of fulfilling on that medical needs and you bring it back home, right? It's not just about novel molecular entities, but it's about how do we really make an impact, a measurable impact in women's lives and in people's lives all over the world. So my final question is the easiest one. Uh, do you have any final comments or thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience before we wrap up today? I, no, well, first of all, again, thank you. I, I always love to get to talk about Dare and what we're doing. It's my favorite thing. So I really appreciate that opportunity to, to share all that. And um, and my last comment would be actually, again, with the Dare theme, um, one of our, uh, so the name Dare means to give in Italian, but um, in English, it's dare, it means to be bold. And, um, and, and I really embrace that. And we embrace that in our corporate branding and, and we say daring to be different and, you know, we be bold. It's all across our corporate branding because those are two tenants that I think for women uh, and, and for any um, group that feels, you know, underrepresented or, or, you know, their voice is not heard. Um, you know, we can't be fearful. We have to be bold. We have to be daring. We have to get out there. So if, if I can have last comments, it would be, you know, be bold and dare to be different. Oh, thank you. I think we you must have spoken to me way back when I was still in Nigeria. Because, <laughs> honestly, because my passion for coming to America and establishing this amplifying scientific innovation platform because it's because I, I dare to be different and I dare to be bold. And that's a message that I think that hopefully people that watch this also share and people that listen to it as well. So thank you for encouraging us to think outside the box, to be different, to be bold and to think about innovation from a terms of the patient impact and, and, and truly making a difference. So I appreciate your time. And obviously I look forward to staying in touch. Something tells me I'll be speaking with you very, very soon. So thank you. For yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Sabrina. Have a good one. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.